Hello and welcome to News Click's show, Mapping Fault Lines. And this week, we're going to be talking about an incident that took place last Sunday, that's May 23rd, where a Ryanair flight was uh, made to land in Belarus after the Belarusian authorities said that there was a bomb threat. Later, it turned out that Roman Protasevich, a journalist, a dissident, who has been launching, doing a major campaign against the Belarusian government, was on board and he was detained. Now, this has led to a major international diplomatic spat. We've seen very familiar denunciations from the West, especially the European Union. On the other hand, the Belarusian president, Alexander Lukashenko, has said that this was a proportional action made uh, as per the law and as per various conventions. So we have Prabir Purkaisa to talk about this. Prabir, so uh, of course, uh, the Western media has clearly framed this as one of these intrepid human rights defenders being targeted by a dictatorial regime, which is how they usually frame many of these stories. But later reports have actually shown that the picture is far more complicated, that there are many more elements to this than was earlier thought. And so could you maybe first, let's quickly go through the incident and see what are the holes, so to speak, in this narrative that is being presented in almost a uniform way by the big media in the West? Well, you know, there are two parts to this question that you are asking. One is the, what's the response of the global media and how hypocritical or otherwise it is. Other is the issue of who was this person, which the Belarusian government obviously wanted to uh, take a charge of at arrest and uh, file cases against him. So if we look at the Western media's response, and I think that uh, would be the starting point, and also the response of the Western governments talking about the Chicago Convention, et cetera. It's important that they do not re recognize the fact that Western governments have repeatedly done this going back as far back as 1956, when uh, Ben Bella, who became later on the president of Alger Algeria, was also arrested in a similar fashion with another four of his colleagues. The plane was brought to Algiers and he was put in prison for, I think, about the next four or five years. So this is starting from that. There is a whole history of this. The most recent being, of course, that of Evo Morales, the president of Bolivia, when his flight was forced to land because the overflight conditions were withdrawn mid-air and his flight was forced to land in Austria. And that was because there was a rumor or there was intelligence information, which proved to be wrong, that Edward Snowden was on board and therefore that he might go to Ecuador and Bolivia and seek uh, asylum there. Therefore, Evo Morales, the president of Bolivia's plane was brought down. So this was a blatant violation of not only the Chicago Convention, but also the sheer fact that here was the president of a country was put into a dangerous situation because they refused mid-air overflight uh, uh, permissions, which they had given. So if you withdraw overflight permissions mid-air, obviously you are creating a dangerous situation for the flight itself. So none of this ever came to the Chicago Convention. This issue never came in front of the International Civil Aviation Organization which is the one which the UN agency which looks after what is commonly known as the Chicago Convention. So this is the first time this complaint has come, but even before the complaint has come, sanctions have been imposed. So is it within the legal powers of the government to do so or not, has not yet been tested in any international platform. The country, European Union has already decided to impose sanctions. We'll come back to this later. The other issue is who is the protagonist? The one, of course, is the government of Belarus. Other is Roman Protasevich. And his antecedents are not in public domain as much as they should be. So some of the papers have started reporting it because it's very difficult to keep everything uh, really under the, are uh, behind the curtain. After all, leaks are taking place. His true uh, picture is emerging. He is a fascist. He is a self-confessed one. His pictures are there all over with fascist emblem, his being a part of the Azov battalion. Initially, it was said he was a press officer, press person with the back battalion, which is Azov battalion, as you, everybody knows, is a part of a fascist outfit, which is in Ukraine. And he 
is now known to have fought in the in the battalion, participated in fights in Donbas. So it is not something which is being alleged. It is something which he is already on record. His next metamorphosis is to become the U.S. agencies, various U.S. agencies, public spokesperson for you for uh, Belarus, and he finally first headed or was a part of the Radio Free Europe, which you know is an American uh, funded, controlled outfit. Its history is very well known, so I'm not going to go into that. And later on into Nexta, which again became an out outlet for anti-Belarus government's uh, campaigns, again funded by the National Endowment of Democracy and supported by the US. So first, he was a fascist, participated as such in Ukraine, and later on got, got co-opted by the United States. They're quite happy to co-opt such people into their campaigns. And this is what this person, Roman Protasevich, is. Now, whether this is uh, journalistic, he's got a journalistic right to say whatever he wants is another matter. But that he's a self-confessed fascist being nurtured by the United States, various agencies, is something which should concern, uh, cause concern. And the fact that the European Union has now uh, basically made him as a defender of press freedom is also equally surprising because fascists are not particularly known to speak for press freedoms, particularly when they're in power. And even when they're not, they're quite well known for attacking press. The freedom of the press, therefore, doesn't exist in their eyes. So the fact that he has now become the major savior of Belarus and its press freedom is rather ironical. Absolutely, Prabir. In this context, you'd mentioned the sanctions that the European Union has imposed, maybe more restrictions coming in the days to come as well. So how do we see this uh, sort of policy overreach at this point of time when in the context of what you mentioned, there are, his record is problematic and uh, there is also the very hypocrisy by the Europeans, especially considering their records on this? You know, if you look at international law, this should have gone to ICA for discussions. If there was something else to be discussed, it could have gone to the United Nations Security Council. The fact that it did not seems to indicate that the legal position of the parties concerned, the European Union in this case, and Belarus are not as strong as the media claims. That as a country over which this flight was taking place, even if overflight uh, permissions had been given, Belarus had certain uh, powers. Now, whether these powers were enough for them to force the Ryanair aircraft or not, that's a question which could have been dealt legally in other platforms existing within the United Nations system. The fact that the European Union did not go into any of these platforms, impose sanctions, indicates certain things. One is it believes that it is above international law, that whatever it says is international law, and therefore they have the right to impose sanctions. Now, sanctions particularly financial sanctions. We don't know what are the kind of sanctions that are going to come in the future. But if you look at sanctions, a sanction regime without United Nations Security Council resolution is actually a violation of international law. This has been pointed out time and again, that the only binding sanctions that you can use are as United Nations Security Council sanctions. Any other sanctions, including financial sanctions, could be construed as an act of war, particularly financial sanctions are akin to uh, acts of war. So this particular method that the Western demo so-called democracies are adopting repeatedly, that they have an international right to sanction whoever they want by sitting down, discussing it, not bringing it to United Nations, shows a rather uh, dangerous drift in international uh, situations. And I think this is a long-term cause of concern because it's basically saying United Nations is no longer the platform for us. What we sit and discuss, what we will decide as the so-called democracies leading the international world order, the new world international world order, which where we will decide what are the rules. Now, they have never defined what the rules are. The rules are whatever we like to do are the rules. 
And we not defining the rules means that we can therefore create the playbook as we go along. And this has become now the modus operandi for all these sanctions and all these issues, whether it is sanctions in Russia, whether it is sanctions in China, whether it is sanctions in Venezuela, it doesn't really matter. The unilaterally, the so-called Western democracies, which in my mind are essentially colonial, ex-colonial and ex-settler colonial states, whether you should call them ex-settler colonial states is a different issue that they can make up the rules of the world. Other countries don't have any voice in this. This is the new world order in which the rule book will be decided by these handful of countries. And that's why the European Union Union step in this direction is actually very similar what to what the US has been propagating. So what we find is an alignment of the so-called uh, rules of the game that they are now propounding, which will be decided by only them. Absolutely. And Prabir, finally, just uh, wanted to take maybe a look at the larger politics of the region itself. We cannot see this incident and especially the Western response in isolation from the protests that took place in Belarus last year, the response of the West at that point, you know, there was an entire political media NGO centered response to basically stage a color revolution there. It was pretty obvious at that point. So how do we see not only just this incident, but the current geopolitical situation in that region itself where Belarus and Russia have a particular dynamic. And of course, the West is now very keen on making sure that uh, Alexander Lukashenko is over. If you talk about the larger picture, this is very clear that you have as close ties between Russia and China developing. And uh, Russia has, tried to reach out to European Union, the United States, it's been rebuffed cons consistently. And it has been asked to take a subordinate position, which it is not willing to take, justifiably. So given that Russia and China have come much closer together. So what is increasingly being is visible is that Eastern Europe, the Baltics, the Eastern European countries, these are in play which way they will go. Most of them have already aligned with NATO. And therefore the few that have not are under pressure of different kinds. And obviously Belarus is one of the key ones. This play is also extended to, is extending to Central Asia. Right. So you're going to see this whole region come into play. And mainly because once China's Belt Road Initiative takes uh, steam and it is already gathering steam, it has linked itself to Germany there is regular freight which goes between China uh, through uh, Russia mm -hmm. into uh, Eastern Europe and then further on to uh, Germany. Right. All of this is creating a condition where Europe could in fact play a role by which it acts as a kind of bridge between these countries, Russia and China and the United States. So the play is really to get them commit against Russia and against China. And all of these therefore can be seen as signals that which way the, the NATO partners and particularly the Western European countries will lean towards. And as of now, with Biden coming into power, the Trump's in your face, America first position being given up, the allies being handled with a little more uh, softness, though in terms of the actual policies, not much has changed. But the fact is the optics has changed, means that Western Europe is now willing to look towards, increasingly towards the United States and hoping thereby to maintain its hegemony over the world as a partner of the United States. The realignment which was possible that Western Europe plays a more uh, neutral role, so to say, between uh, United States, China, and Russia. This seems to be now not on the cards. And we see a weakening, therefore, of Western Europe's independence positions. Now, how much of this is a precursor to that? Is it that this, this, this mixed signals? Because Nord Stream 2 is still on, the pipe, uh, gas pipeline, which is between Russia and Germany. 
that has not been abandoned as the United States was trying. So how much independent position Western Europe will take for its own economic interest and political interest remains to be seen. But the signals on this with the Belarusian incident, for instance, earlier with uh, what we saw in Russia itself with Navalny, all of this are not good portents. And therefore, I think that Western Europe still is veering increasingly towards United States or remaining in that camp. And that realignment of a possibility of its playing a more independent role is not really uh, bearing, uh, bearing out. So I think that is the takeaway that I would have from this Belarusian incident, not so much as what happens to Belarus, but what happens to Western Europe itself. Absolutely. Thank you so much, Prabir, for talking to us. That's all we have time for today. Keep watching news.